FM. 99.3 Babylon FM. What is up, beautiful people? March the 26th, 2018, and the day just got more beautiful. It's got amazingly more beautiful. We are so excited. We have a special guest. Nor I will guest. Nor I will give you the the honor of well, the I mean, introduction. I mean, it's okay. No, no, no. I know I know you're super excited since now you find out that like you guys are from the same area, region, whatever. I don't know what <laughs> you You were both about. blushing when you came in. <laughs> we're oh super we're super excited. We're super excited. We have a mystery guest here and we couldn't really announce it because of you know whatever. But now he's here and we are so honored. Finally, it has happened. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the U.S. General Counsel, it is Ken Gross. Good morning! Thanks so much. Really appreciate you having me here. I'm excited to be part of the Breakfast Club and looking forward to what we're able to do this morning. All right. This is not, again, this is not a fight. This is not, not a match. This is just a friendly conversation between friends. It's right, also Ken? not scripted. No, no, not at all. <laughs> this is the first time we met you. All right, this is how it's going to work, you guys. So, of course, there's been a lot of things that have been happening for the past six, seven months. Now is the opportunity for you to ask the U.S. Consul General any question <laughs> you have. You heard that correctly. Again, just be respectful. 07505993993. Ask us the questions and we will text us and we will um, get it and see but if we again, get the answer. But again, don't be too Aiba with yeah, the questions because we will them. filter it. Don't exactly. be exactly. Remember the word I taught you? We don't want to be too Ben Amus today, okay? <laughs> don't want to do that. Ken, thank you so much for joining us. Let's try to get to know you first of all. Sure. Uh, you've been here actually over a year. Yep, over a year and a half now. Wow. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you, you have a history in Iraq, but how did you end up being in Erbil? How did that decision come about? Yeah, well, you know, in my foreign service, we always bid on our next post. So we get a list of posts that are available. And when it came time for me to look at my next post, I could stay in Washington. I had some good offers there. But I saw that Erbil principal officer job was open. I served in Basra, I served in Baghdad, so I really wanted to complete the trifecta and get Erbil. Never been to the Kurdistan region, so um, it was the only job overseas I bid on, and luckily I was able to get it. Wow. Super cool. You've been here now more than the average U.S. Consul General that stays here. It's usually a year and the things get changed, so whose decision was that? Your, your decision or the, a little bit higher decision? Um, they asked me if I wanted to do two years. I said, let me get there first. And <laughs> we were changing over ambassadors, so I wanted to talk to the new ambassador as well. So I got here, and after a couple of months, I talked to some folks and decided to go ahead and do a second year. Okay. We tried to find out your, your background, and we still don't know from which state you grew up in. Is it Georgia? It's hard to figure out because um, I moved all over as a kid. So yeah. I went to 10 different schools my first 12 years oh, of wow. schooling. My dad was in the Air Force, so we lived all over. I was living in Georgia when I joined the Foreign Service. I was working there as an attorney, and I've been doing that for a number of years. Yeah, because you got your BA uh, from Auburn, and, and you got a law degree at the George University of Georgia School of Law. So right. we were thinking you were from Georgia, but... Uh, yeah, well, I lived in Georgia for a while as a kid, then went back to law school there, but okay. um, all over the States and also in Europe growing up. Cool. So you were in... Um, you know, I want to ask you this question. You were the Deputy Chief of Mission in Tajikistan from 2002 to 2004. We want to know about this. So yeah, this is so something we really want to know about. So apparently you speak the language Tajiki. How did this happen? <laughs> you know, for the Foreign <laughs> Service, some of our posts, some of our positions are language designated. So you have to have the language to go to the job and to get the job. So you either have it ahead of time or they teach you. So um, I had a year of Tajiki language training at our Foreign Service Institute in Arlington before I went to Dushanbe the first time. But like, I, you have experience in all the continents. How did you find yourself so interested in like the whole culture? To li really, I think you've done two stints now there, correct? Yeah. How did you just, you know, what was, what's so interesting about Tajikistan that really, you know, got you going there? Well, I was interested in Persian literature, language, and culture. So Tajiki is, language is very close to Persian. Written language is different because it's Cyrillic alphabet. Mm -hmm. But the spoken language is similar, and it was former part of the Persian Empire. So I thought that'd be a cool place to go. Okay. So basically what you're saying that if the relations were good with Iran, yeah. it would have been in Iran. <laughs> but you went to, you went to Tajikistan. That's about as close as I could get. Very yeah. interesting. You've lived, I want to say, at least half of your life outside of the U.S., correct? Right. Do you, when you look back at everything that you've done, um, are you happy that, that that your life turned out to be that way? Do you? Because for me, like for me, it's been ten years since I moved back, and I'm, I have a feeling of a, of a something in the middle. Sometimes I miss America, or well, sometimes I feel happy here, and sometimes when I'm there. Do you ever miss the U.S. when you're long when you're gone for so long? 
I mean, you always miss certain things, certain、mm. people. But a lot depends, I think, on how you view growing up and what you're looking for in life. So, as I said, I moved a lot as a kid. And I look at my sister, and when my father you know, retired, she said, That's it, I'm not moving again. And she hasn't.、Um, but for me, I really enjoy going to different places, getting to know people, getting to see things I wouldn't normally see if I was just visiting a place as a tourist. So the lifestyle really appealed to me. So I was working in Atlanta as a lawyer. I've been doing that, and、um, I could have stayed there, had great friends,、uh, enjoyed what I was doing. But I thought I'd really like to see more of the world. If you guys are joining us, this is a history in the making. The U.S. <laughs> Consul General is joining us, Ken Gross, and he's giving you guys the opportunity to ask any question you want. Go ahead, text it now 0750 59939. 993 any question. We are waiting for the question. So go ahead and ask us, and we'll be more than happy to answer it. So we have Tanya. She's checking in.、Uh, her question for you, Mr. Gross, is <laughs> how do you manage? To stay in such good shape. Oh, Whoa! I, I thought this was a radio broadcast. A, <laughs> we're not on TV, are we? You've done a lot of public appearances. Yeah, so she might, ha- she、um, might be your fan.、Um, you know, what I do most of the day and evening is sit. You know, I go from one meeting to another, I'm at my computer. But I do get up、um, usually fairly early in the morning, around four, sometimes five. Just to get a workout in before the day starts. So I try to do that every day. 4 a.m.? I know. I'm not、Ooh. a morning person. So right now,、wow. I haven't had my coffee yet. So my hand's shaking a little bit. But yeah. <laughs> Tachi! <laughs> <laughs> Has,、uh, so you've been here for over a year and a half. So I'm going to ask you the very basic questions.、Uh, what's your favorite food here? Because <laughs> I'm assuming they bring you. Some yeah, stuff to try. I mean, the good thing is,、uh, Kurdish cuisine is very、um, varied. Lots of good things、yeah. there. But I'm very simple in my taste. <laughs> so、um, I really like a good kebab. So、really? I was lucky、nice. enough to finally eat at Yassin's. And in the bazaar. The, new, the bazaar or the new one?、Uh, the, the original one, of course. Ah, and, yeah, the original.、Um, I've been wanting to get there, and、um, I used the excuse of having my ambassador in town <laughs> to go there. So we were there a couple of weeks ago. So, so you went、really、to Kebab, Kebab Yassin in, in the market? Yeah, in the bazaar, yeah. How do you shut that down for you to be able to go?、Yeah. How did well, that even happen? We didn't shut it down, but we, we were there with a few、uh, ministers as、oh, well. So、okay. they had their security and my security. So no、security. baseball cap? No, glasses, no, 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 no. Big hoodies. No. We had our own private table. Oh, very nice. We've got a few people checking in right now, Zane. Yeah, we have、uh, Maddie from The Hook. His question for you is Why is it kind of impossible to get a tourist visa to the U.S.? <laughs> people want to see the U.S. to get to know the lifestyle there. So. And he goes on, he says, you know, I know you want to put rules in there where you want to make sure people come back actually not to stay there. So this topic is also an important topic besides the topic that we're waiting for. But let's talk about this whole visa thing. He says it's kind of impossible. I, mean, I don't know what kind of percentage rate, it, percentage rate is it. I'm guessing it's like a 90% decline, 10% success. Tell us about the whole, the whole point about this whole you know, visa, tourism visa, the, the whole thing. Go ahead. Yeah. It's not easy to get a visa to the United States, and there's lots of reasons for that. Um, you know, the way our system is set up, you have to prove if you go to the States for a short trip that you must return to your home country. So it's a little bit different from what most people think of. You don't just go in and say, I want to go to Disney World or something like that. You have to show you've got strong reasons to return, in this case, to the Kurdistan region. So a lot of people don't understand that mindset. They just say, I want to go, and they can't explain why they have to come back. The reason for that, and it is in our law, so we're required to. Have that sort of proof by the applicant is because we have so many people who have overstayed in the United States. And so we're trying to limit it to people who are going、um, as genuine business people or as tourists and will be returning. But we know it is difficult.、Um, it is something worldwide. It's not just here in the Kurdistan region and Erbil or in Baghdad. It is difficult to get a visa. But the key thing I, is, I think, to try to understand how we look at it so that the person is prepared when he or she goes in and can try to address our questions, our concerns. I understand your concerns so much because I get angry. People use the system and they abuse it.、Yeah. The whole thing about,、exactly. oh, I'm going to take a tour on the visa and not come back. I get so pissed off because they ruin it for everybody else. And it hurts because people like, that I love, cousins who I've known for 10 years now here, Are taking advantage of it, and I'm never seeing them again because they, you know, they, they go and they don't come back. And again, I, I don't know how this can be solved. Like, I don't know, put like a 
tether in their ankle or something like that to find them to make sure they come back. I think Iraqis would be more than happy to do that, actually. Yeah, you know, find me wherever you want in case if I don't come back. But anyways, I do hope there's a final solution for that. And our next question from, uh, I don't know who, the, oh, Dada. This is Dada says, is it true that an Iraqi green card holder cannot get a job at the U.S. consulate? Um, that's a good question. I'm not, I'm, I'm not Open a, the book. <laughs> yeah, where's the... I'm not an HR person, but I would think that person could get a job if they qualify. But um, obviously having a green card doesn't qualify you by itself to get a job at the consulate. We look at, we hire a lot of people. Um, Even Canadians? All sorts of backgrounds. No. Because <laughs> we might be spies. Depends. <laughs> We can always tell Canadians how they say the word roof. Roof. Like that. Yeah. We roof. just say roof. See? Roof. Yeah. Roof. But so, uh, go ahead. sorry. But go so, ahead. so we do hire everybody that's qualified, that's, that, or the best candidate, I should say. Not everybody is qualified. But um, having a green card, I think, doesn't qualify, give you extra qualifications or extra benefits of getting the job or disqualify you. Um, we got Ahmed checking in. This is an interesting thing also. Uh, he says, will you open the road in front of the American consulate? Well, this question is obsolete because eventually you guys are going to be moving on Masif Road. First of all, um, have, you found, have you seen the new location? Yes, yes. Ooh. Can I ask any question I want? I can ask any question. I may not be able to answer it. But yes. <laughs> was, the land, was the land given for free for the U.S. government or you guys had to actually buy it? Um, a good question, and I think I may have known that answer right when I got here, and I forgot it since I arrived, because I think <laughs> I asked it myself. <laughs> but um, it was done before I got here, so we've had the land, or I'd known where the land would be, um, so I didn't have to deal with that once I got here. Uh, I, go ahead, I heard it was going to be the biggest, the biggest U.S. consulate, consulate yeah, in, the world. in the world. Well, because they need to match the biggest embassy in the in world in Baghdad. Baghdad. So. <laughs> you don't want our bill to be jealous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it will be uh, once it's done. I don't know if it'll be in my lifetime, but hopefully in the next uh, four to six years. Once it's completed, it will be a really nice compound. Ooh. People will be living on it. They'll have it. They have it set up unlike any other embassy or con or concept I've seen in the world. The plans look absolutely fantastic. You know, the people here in Kawa and even in Northern Arabia said so they'll miss you know the U.S. Council being so convenient and close, but I think it's good for everybody. Yeah. Ho hopefully so. I'm not sure since you mentioned the street closing if everybody well, will miss us leaving. <laughs> but let's not, I, mean, I mean, let's not forget the important impacts that you guys do. For example, you've boosted the economy like crazy, you know, ar around that area. All those houses that are getting rent money, I mean, that's not something small. It's a big deal. Um, who else we got? So Hakar uh, has messaged us, says, good morning, everybody. Lots of respect to your guest. Want to thank him for wearing Kurdish clothes and Aww. shoes and celebrating Nodus like we do. Aww. Did you? Did they like get your sizes? Like, how did that work? Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna go to the bazaar. <laughs> yeah, no, I was lucky enough to have somebody come by and uh, a tailor come by, measure me, and uh, I got an outfit from him. So that was really nice. But it was great to be able to celebrate Nodus here. Nodus is a wonderful holiday. I celebrate it in the states as well, although it's much easier celebrating it here. <laughs> um, well, come back to the question because Sabah is also asking: yeah, When will the U.S. Council open the open? The U.S. Council will open the road in Ankawa um, because of the whole attack that happened. Again, do you, I mean I don't know? Do you know any information about that? Because I, I'm surprised you said four to six years until you moved to that council. I thought it was maybe only a few years. Yeah, uh, we don't do anything quickly when it comes to building take the uh, time. buildings. Yeah. Um, as far as opening the road, that was a decision made by um, administrative folks here in Ankawa and the government to close it for security reasons. So it was not something that we did, it was something that the Kurdistan government did, the municipality of Ankawa did. Was that bombing happened during your time or was it a few months before? No, it was before. a year or two yeah. before I oh, got here. It was 2014. So it was, yeah, it was yeah. after um, after that, of course, they decided to close the road. Mm. I think, I, think I, I know this is an unpopular opinion, but I actually agree with the closing of the road because I want to encourage people to walk here and I know that you actually enjoy taking strolls around the, the consulate, so I think that more people should enjoy taking strolls, even if it's for that little strip of uh, yeah. shops. No, it's pretty cool, I think. I like roads actually being closed to yeah. actually have places where they're car-free. If you're just joining us, this is the U.S. Consul General to Erbil, Ken Gross, and we're just so honored, man. I know me, the whole team here in Babylon, we've been waiting for the longest to actually happen. This Soran, um, Kak Salwan, Yusuf, everybody, we just... We're saying, when is this going to happen? Because we've had all the counselors here, and it's been actually a little kind of a, 
no, some obstacles until we get it happen, but I'm glad it finally happened. And I'm just, I'm just, I just want to say thank you in the middle of the interview for making the time for us small time radio. You know, we're nothing special. No, thanks. Like I said, it's an honor for me to be here at the Breakfast Club. Although I was hoping you'd let me choose the music. So go, go, maybe hold I'll on a second. Maybe you have, have, to come back you have a request, absolutely. Go ahead. Give me, give me, give me. Uh, I played I Will Survive. I played We Will Rock You. I mean, I don't know what, what kind of music you would like, but just, you know. I, well, I don't know if you have my favorite. It's easy go ahead. You, you have anything by Eric Clapton? Oh, Ooh, that's pretty modern. Okay, I think we have that. I go back many years with him, so it's not that modern. <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's interesting. Okay, yeah, we do have a little bit of Eric Clapton right here, yeah. Definitely. Um, so I'll, I want to move to this next question. Um, this comes from somebody with no name. Um, and this is not me asking this question. Uh, Are you this sure? is This is <laughs> somebody who has... This is someone who has messaged us, and we can read this, right, Nor? Uh, let's see. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so uh, it says... Why didn't the U.S. support the Kurdistan independence referendum? Don't you believe uh, that Kurdistan can be an independent country? Oh, ever? That, that's uh, Alan checking in. Alan, right? okay. Yeah. Um, good question. It's a question we've had in all sorts of forms for the last few months. Um, we did not, speaking for the United States government, we did not feel it was the right time for that to occur. And as you know, pretty much every country in the region and throughout the world thought it the same, with the possible exception of one country. But all the neighbors, whether it's Iran, Turkey, obviously Baghdad, did not feel it was the right time. We thought that there were some better options available, which we were willing to work with the KRG and, and the government in Baghdad on. So that was the reason why we thought it was not a good time. Obviously, with all the other countries opposition to it, including their neighbors, it makes it awfully difficult to move forward. So yeah. this is, we asked them um, to consider other options. Yeah, and definitely, you know, the United States has had a long-standing partnership in, with the government in Baghdad, so everyone's got to be on the same page yeah. for this type of thing. It's a catch-22 anyways, because if, because nobody's, you know, like, only one country supported the referendum. People were like, oh, it wasn't that serious of a referendum. But if it had gotten support, then they would have said, yes, it meant something. So you can't have it both ways. What right? about the question, though, that he asks is then, do you think that Kurdistan region will never deserve or get independence ever oh. in history? I mean, the whole topic of independence is still very, very hot. Yeah. People still don't want, you know, I, I posted this actually when, when everyone was high on referendum time. <laughs> When people I, were ripping pe up their yeah. Iraqi passports. People here, wrong, wrong decision. People here are just do not want to be stigmatized by the word Iraq anymore. Um, because, you know, what's been happening and, and everything. So, what do, you, what do you say about the whole topic of independence in general, besides the U.S. support for it or not? Well, we understand the aspirations of every citizen in Kurdistan. And that's something we everybody understands, quite frankly. The desire for uh, eventual independence, Kurdistan. But again, what we, our U.S. government decision was, what our policy is, is having, for now, a unified, democratic, prosperous Iraq, with a very important part of that being a strong, viable Kurdistan region. So whether it will happen in the future, hard to predict what's going to happen, but we certainly understand everybody's aspirations here. So you used that word. You said, you know, a strong Kurdistan region. And when a few months back, three months back, uh, Prime Minister Nechevan Barzani, he went on air and he said this, he said that I want to go and talk to the Americans and talk to the Europeans and ask them what do they mean by a strong Kurdistan because I'm not seeing it. We've been completely uh, weakened, as you see. I mean, the difference is, is astonishing six months before and now back and then. Um, what is a strong Kurdistan region? Because right now this is not a str strong Kurdistan region. Well, I think a strong Kurdistan region is, a, is an area that can stand on its own feet that is prosperous economically, that is making salary payments to its citizens, that has a viable economy, that has um, a, a banking system that mm -hmm. works. It's a whole list of things. In fact, it's the type of things you'd want to see for a region to develop before they become independent. But the economy, as you know here, has been um, devastated by the plunge in oil prices and, of course, by Daesh. Um, so it needs to, as they're doing, I think, it needs to get on its feet. They need to do some reforms and um, encourage more foreign investment, which hopefully will be a little easier now with uh, the airports reopening. Okay. If you want to ask more regarding that topic, go ahead. 07505-993-993. At least we know the elephant 
is kind of in the room. We're not like ignoring it, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, we're definitely not ignoring it. So Ad is checking in, says, my question uh, to the U.S. Consul is, do you guys think the Iraqi people deserve to get immigration visas to the United States? Because, I don't know if this is uh, to Aiba, but uh, it says, because the U.S. was the reason behind ruining their lives and their country. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. I wonder what that person's perspective is. <laughs> it's kind of hard for me to tell. Um, obviously, we look at, you asked about immigrant visas, I guess, for Iraqi citizens. We look at that like we do every other country to see whether they qualify. And there's all these different categories of that. So the fact of our relationship, what's happened here in Iraq, in the Kurdistan region in the last 15 years, doesn't change how we, how we issue visas of that nature. Poor guy, he doesn't know how to turn off the notification. He says, I know everything about Donald Trump. <laughs> He'd be tweeting me every hour. <laughs> but seriously, I mean, our policy here in um, Kurdistan region, in Iraq, yes. Syria, you name it, has not changed. Okay. Um, so it hasn't really had an effect on our um, overreaching policies here in the region. Okay. Do you think you'll ever get a chance to, to meet the, the president? Have you ever met the president before? Not this president. I've met other presidents. But okay. um, I have no um, appointments lined up. <laughs> are you guys like as a council general like by law are not supposed to like publicly reveal if you're like Democratic or Republican or that doesn't matter? You're not supposed to let be, uh, be um, you're not supposed to be biased. Biased, right? Yeah, I mean the whole idea of our foreign service is a professional foreign service. You serve whoever yeah. is the president, whatever party. If you have differences, you do not voice those. Mm -hmm. If you feel you cannot continue to serve or you disagree strongly enough, then you resign. I mean, that's something that we all swore an oath to when we joined. You saw the big anger that was happening yesterday. I'm sure your team briefed you thousands by the thousands of protests, and it wasn't just Sleimani uh, this time around. People are angry. More, imagine working for a whole year for free. How can this be solved? I mean, we've talked and, and you've emphasized so many times dialogue, 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 dialogue. What can be done for people to actually finally get their worth, their right? They, you know, they said this is my right, their money. How can this finally happen? And you know, what can the KRG do? Finally, just you know, clean this mess. That's a good question for the KRG, yeah. obviously. <laughs> so, but uh, you, you're, you're, you're like the big brother. You're supposed to advise them because we're not, we don't have the greatest democracy in the world here, you know? No, I'll, I'll talk to the prime minister, see if he wants to join you guys next week. <laughs> yes. but, um, I'll be the chiller in the background. You'll have to change the flag out there. Though. Yeah. Um, seriously, though, um, I think the government is working on that. Obviously, they've had, particularly with what's happened since October 16th and the loss of oil fields around Kirkuk and the revenue from that oil, their revenues have diminished. So what they're doing now is trying to figure out how to pay as much of the salaries as they can with that revenue and with the additional funds that have just started coming in from Baghdad. So um, it really is a good question for the KRG. I don't want to be presumptuous and try to answer for them, but I know they are looking at that and I know they are working on that. Okay. Okay. Um, we have another question. Another sticky situation. Yeah. Oof, th this oof. one's a little bit sticky. You know, Get obviously ready, we know what's been happening um, with our neighbor, with the, the Kurdish region in Syria lately, um, and everything that's been going on there in Afrin. So we have somebody checking in. I don't know their name, but they said, uh, "Why did the U.S. let Turkey attack and take Afrin? Will it also let Turkey attack uh, Shingal?" and Iraqi Kurdistan. And let, let's talk about how, what kind of a humanitarian catastrophe has been happening. 150,000 people have ran. They don't want to live by these new rulers. And minority villages ex exist there just like they exist in Nineveh Plains when ISIS came in Rome and we, everybody saw the pictures and videos of the looting. Talking about at least 15 to 20 Yazidi villages over there. It's just basically another Shingal in terms of the, the, the pain that they're suffering. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how can, I mean, go ahead. Well. Unfortunately, the United States is not all powerful. We're not able to you know, snap our fingers and have other countries do our bidding, mm -hmm. and that wouldn't be a good situation anyway. But we did not, um, we were not asked about that. We were, we were not um, involved in any of the planning for that operation. We did not think it was a good idea. We do not want it to continue. We do have some military forces that are presently in some of those regions. They have not left. Um, we are talking to the Turks continually at very high levels to try to make sure that um, everybody's equities are protected and there's not a further um, increase 
you know, all the problems with dislocations of people, which has been devastating already in this part of the world, mm -hmm. and now it's just increasing more. So we're in touch with our NATO ally, Turkey, um, but um, you mentioned uh, Shingal. Mm -hmm. We're certainly... Um, he threatened just yesterday. We're going to go yeah. there. Well, they're, it's they're, ridiculous. They're already there. It's well, ridiculous. Uh, they're already they're, there. No, no. They're, no. they're near Bashika and they were planning... They've I don't know had what they were their camp do, in Bashika for a while. Anyways, but yeah. th these, these threats should not, you know, be made even. These people just recently came back from a genocide, you know? Go, I, I mean... I don't know, how, how can this, this be tolerated, just all these verbal threats without the U.S. actually coming down with a strong, firm, you know, reaction, just like, just like they do when, when Russia does something bad? Um, like I said, we are talking to them, we are trying to deal with that, but it's not just a question of the United States saying, don't do that, stop mm -hmm. that. This whole area in that part of Syria, as you know, it has a number of different forces. The Russians are there with their air power. The Syrian government is there. There's other entities that are fighting in those areas. So it's not just a question of, oh, one country can say something to another country and it will stop. There's a lot of other people and a lot of other groups involved in those operations. Very Did messy. You, if you're just joining us, we have the U.S. Consul General here for the first time in Babylon Media's history. Ken Gross joining us. We've got a few more minutes. You can ask us questions. 07505-903-993. When is your term ending up technically? Around? Uh, about the end of July. End of July. So you're going to be here for the upcoming elections. Yes. Uh, what do you think? What do you think is going to happen? Do you think it's going to go for the worse, <laughs> for the better? I don't know. You know, I, I think it's a great opportunity for people to get out and vote. You know, whether you support the present government or you support somebody else, this is a chance to make your voice heard. So, for the elections in Iraq, obviously, it's a great opportunity for um, Kurds to say who they think their their representative should be, and then, of course, the elections probably later in the fall in the Kurdistan region. So there's a question that I want to ask. I don't really know how to phrase this, but, you know, I'm an American and I absolutely love my country. This flag I brought in this morning, uh, it sits on my wall and, you know, I would die for my country. I love the United States of America and I really feel blessed to be an American. And it really hurts me when I see a lot of people around here starting to talk worse and worse about the United States. And oh, that's I, I, right. it really hurts me because I want people to be like, you know, we're not bad. Like we, yeah. we really have emotional. good intentions. Look at this face. Look how nice oh, it is. And <laughs> so what do you say to, to the, you know, as a representative of our government, uh, what do you say to people that are starting to have a negative view towards, you know, what we're doing? I mean, I usually try to find out why they, why they have those yeah. views. Um, it was interesting after the referendum and the things that occurred immediately subsequent to that, how people react against the United States. The United States is not supporting Kurdistan. The United States has abandoned us. All what that sort of yeah, stuff. When you saw we, those our, signs. our policy had not changed. We had not done anything. We spoke to yeah. the government before him. We were speaking to the government afterwards. We still supported Kurdistan. And um, again, the building of our um, new consulate is a really concrete example of mm -hmm. that. You know, Us putting that time, that investment mm -hmm. that into the future, our future here in the Kurdistan region. But um, we tried, obviously it's an emotional issue for yeah. everything that happens, so facts don't always persuade people. And people sometimes want things more than what we can offer, but the fact is we did not change our policy with the referendum. We did not want to punish Kurdistan. That was the furthest right. thing from our minds. We were trying to bring Erbil and Baghdad closer together after all the events that happened. So. Mm -hmm. Try and explain to them what we were doing, um, depending upon their background, explain what we had been trying to do in the run up to the referendum, but just trying to make sure they understood that, um, you know, whatever their perception may be, that's not our intention, that's not what our goal is in the Kurdistan region. Good, because we need friends. We need we more friends than just the mountains. Yeah, we need for more friends than just the mountains. The Lord knows that. There's a lot of friends, you know, to the Kurdistan region, but. I think it is just an emotional issue. I think that people kind of expect too much. They think that they're like a favorite and then they get special treatment and that's not always the case. But I do, I, I don't know uh, for you, Zane, but as far as I know, everybody that I know still loves the U.S. and they still want to go there. <laughs> of course, and speaking of going there, you know, I don't know what you know about Babylon Film, but we're a small team. We're like just six people. One of them is our intern, intern Rosie. She's just texting in right now. She says, will he give me a visa? I promise I will come back. So do you do WASTA for visas or how does it work exactly? Yeah. 
I didn't bring any with me today. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't give any. I, I, I well, you had them in your pockets. <laughs> oh, what a trick that would have been to play on the fans. Be the first 10 to text in. You yeah, get a visa. Get a visa. <laughs> we could have a raffle or something like that. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Um, but let's ask a few more questions before we let you go. A few more important topics that mm -hmm. always get, um, you know, the U.S. Council is always involved with. One of them is this. Um, the U.S. government every year... It celebrates the LGBT com uh, community. I forgot what day it is, it is, but throughout its council in the U.S., they raise the LGBT flag. And every year when this does, and you guys post it on Facebook, you, you, get, you get a certain amount of hate for that. Trolls. Yeah, so what do you say to a lot of people saying, well, this is not our culture, this is not our country, what are you trying to do here? Are you trying to change us and make us be, you know, like you in terms of what, what your perspective regarding, or your opinion regarding the whole LGBT thing? I think it's a great opportunity when we do something like that, which we've done the last couple of years, is to raise the flag just to increase awareness mm -hmm. of the issue and make people think about it and talk about it. We're not trying to say do as we do or do as we say. Mm. We're trying to say this is what many of us believe in and we think it's a topic that others should discuss and decide what they believe in as well. You might, they might be giving hope to people who don't have a voice here, who feel isolated, and then when they see support, from the U.S. consulate for those rights, you know, it's, it gives them encouragement. I think he's handled, he's handled this interview pretty well, you guys. What do you think? <laughs> of course. Yeah, I, I know you're, you've got a question just waiting. No, just waiting. <laughs> I really don't have anything uh, hidden like that. No, I, but you haven't, you haven't <laughs> sweat once. You know, you haven't done this once. You know, like you well, yeah, because you have this. That yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's, it's like at 14 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> we got a lot of people in the room, and with the light, sometimes it gets really warm. But um, to be honest with you, I don't think I have any other questions. I mean, you addressed the important thing about this whole. Oh, I did you? You know, you know turn your back on us or not and you made it very clear that the US government is not planning on doing that proof evidence number one we're building the biggest council in the entire world right here that's going to continue to be a strong backing of this region I mean I don't know how else we can tackle this whole Kurdistan American thing Speak yeah. patient. so I've got a question planned um, this is a very light question I don't even know if you've heard of this guy before but his name's Demario Mayfield Okay, oh. and he's an American citizen from Georgia. He's a basketball player, and he came to Oh, a, that's right! He yeah. came to Iraq, and he became an Iraqi citizen to play basketball. Do you know about him? Have no, you ever I do heard not. about him? No. no. This guy doesn't speak Arabic, of course, you know, grew up in, in Atlanta. <laughs> So right. he's playing for the Iraqi national team? Playing no, he, for the Iraqi national team. And he plays for a local club called El Nefet, which is like the oil club. So <laughs> what do you think about this guy? He, he's a dual citizen now. This guy should be highlighted. He's yeah. trying to <laughs> I mean, you see that a lot now, especially in playing in the Olympics or other things. Um, you have people, we had a number of people, Americans, who grew up in the United States, but of Korean ancestry, who were back there representing Korea, for right. example, yeah. in, the, in the Winter Olympics. The sisters. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you see that more and more. I think it's an opportunity for people to play on an international stage, to do something different. And we have Americans, as you know, who play in all sorts of leagues throughout uh, Europe and Asia and Russia. So um, it's kind of similar to that, I think. You've got to meet this guy. I mean, he's just here, is he here in Erbil? He's in Baghdad. Oh, okay. It's just an interesting <laughs> story. <laughs> he's my friend on Facebook. I message him. I'm like, when are you going to come to Erbil? We want to talk he's to like, you. He's like, invite me and I'll come. Yeah. Really? Just buy my plane ticket in a hotel and I'll come. Buy, buy his plane ticket. <laughs> Because this guy, Give him a bus making. ticket. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not a good idea. Before before we go, we're getting close to the end. But again, we got a few more people checking in with the same thing. Okay, um, the whole topic of when do you think Kurdistan or the people here will will get the freedom that they deserve? What's your last message to all the young Kurdish people here? You know, listening to you right now regarding freedom, regarding independence, regarding all these things. I think it's important for particularly the young people, but for everybody, to decide what they can do themselves. Mm. It's not a question of you know, whether it's an organization or the government, it needs to start with the individual and maybe individuals banding together decide they want to have an initiative to do something, whether it's related to something in their local community or whatever. But to think that, you know, it really rests with them and what they mm -hmm. want to do, mm -hmm. they need to be vocal about it, they need to talk to other people about it, and they need to try to, to do it in concert with others. But it's not something that someone from on high is going to give them. That just doesn't work that way. you got to give the power back to the people, you know? Um, I wish I could ask more questions. I have so many. I really do, actually. Yeah. But you I haven't even asked anything about, like, I have you so learn any Kurdish words? What's yeah, your favorite Kurdish word? Exactly. I mean, wh what have you learned in terms of our <laughs> society here? Because you go a lot more out than the previous, previous ones, consulates. Um, no, it's great to get out and see things and to see places. Um, 
that's one of the great benefits of this job is being able to do that. And can't go quite everywhere you want to go, but mm. you have the chance to travel around the Kurdistan region to meet people and talk to them. That's the greatest benefit of the job. The language itself, I have to admit, I'm, I feel really bad about that. I was trying to get a month of language training before I came here. I thought if I had that, that would get me going. Uh, the fact is I don't have a whole lot of time to study language here, so I haven't done much of the Kurdish language. Did you make it to Mosul yet? Have you, have you I've been it? to Mosul, yes. Yeah, Are you I, responsible for Mosul for, as part of the Erbil Consulate? No, we don't cover it, but in point of fact, we are close to Nineveh and yeah. everything else, mm -hmm. so um, we, along with the embassy, both kind of cover it. Mm. Interesting. I'm, I'm thinking. <laughs> I, I, had, I had a few other questions. The, the whole topic of, you know, here, lots of other consulates, they spend a lot of time here, like one of the, not just the consul general, all their staff, they stay for four or five years, so they just literally become part of the community. Do you agree this whole American policy of, hey, let's move them in one year or max two years, you know, every, every time? It makes sense in a way. It's, it's the way our assignment system works. We stay from anywhere from one year to three years. So if we're in Paris, it's normally a three-year tour. It's based upon, for us, the hardship and what's perceived as the danger at a place. Mm. So there's very few posts that are one year. This is one of them. Um, but we do have a few like that. I mean, we're separated from our families. We, um, you know, all sorts of reasons make it more difficult for us. We're not able to get out and do things we normally do. So that increases the hardship differential for us. And that's what the key thing is in terms of how long you stay there. I think one year is an awfully short period of time. That's one of the reasons I, I decided to do two years. But you got to understand people are separated from their family. They may have kids back in the States or elsewhere. They don't get to see very often. So it's difficult to be away from them for a long period of time. About, um, you see lots of events happening here. Yesterday you saw the Spring Festival, for example. I don't know if you saw pictures or not. But um, what's your, you know, your thought? Do you think this is a good influence? And by the way, Babylon Media is going to Baghdad and they're gonna, we're going to be doing this in Baghdad. Yes, believe it or not, I believe April the 15th. We're going there and we're doing it. We're this, coming there. I, I, yes, because we want to start, you know, the, the whole, you know what our, our specialty is here. You know, we're non, you know, serious yeah. things. We want to be... Make people Entertainment, happy. Entertainment, make happy. Our policy is just make people more open-minded and more liberal. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion about these things? Are they too strong? Are they too much? Or is this the right kind of antidote this I think, I think it's great to have that outlet, to have the ability to get out and do things like mm -hmm. that. You have to have, offer people a chance to, to do things, and that's a great opportunity for them. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I'm a, I don't know. You guys have anything else you want to say? Uh, just, yeah, thank you so much. It's really been an honor to have you here. And, you know, we're, we're really happy. And this was a great interview. I, I don't have any more, any more questions. Yes. Good, good fans checking in from uh, actually in Europe as well. Oh. And uh, described you as a level 100 diplomat. <laughs> and that's the bottom oh. level, is that right? Uh, those no, are that's, level that's 1,000? The, the best. <laughs> well, I have one more question. I've got a question for you too. Why don't you, oh, why don't you do yours first? Okay, well, I was going to say, when you retired, out of all these places you've been, where, seriously, would you, you want to retire and live the rest of your life in America, or where do you see yourself? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the States is an easy place to retire to. I've got a place there and everything else. Specific states? Uh, I'm in Virginia right now, in the Washington area. So that's easy to go back to, um, but I like a lot of places throughout the world, so either visit or live overseas for some time sounds great to me. Go ahead, the floor is all yours. You can ask any of us three any question you have. And, oh. and, and by the really? way, yes, go ahead. Oh, he's got, gonna, I've got a list oh. here. Um, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh. No, actually, ask for it. That's, that'll be a separate show. I'll interview you guys. That's um, amazing. Awesome. But uh, just gonna ask about the Eric Clapton song. Oh, oh yeah. my God! Where is it? Hold on one second. <laughs> I'm gonna. <laughs> Bell Bottom Blues or something like that. <laughs> you know, we we should have asked the team what kind of songs you wanted so we could get them ready. I feel so embarrassed. I should have nah. had the whole song. I, I, we have a library of of like eighty thousand songs. Like I know we have them here, but it's just it's yeah. such a big file. We have to. We, it's such a big server. We have to look for it and. Dang it, I should have prepared for this. No, that's I'm so okay. sorry. We're no. so into the questions. Yeah, next time maybe I come back and be a uh, guest DJ and I'll queue up my yes. songs. There we go. Can you imagine? That would be like in the news in America. <laughs> Coming up next on Action 7, yeah. American Consul General changes his job to a DJ for one day in Iraq. Yeah. And who knows, maybe it could be a new career path. Wow, and we would love to. We would love to hire you. You here. have a very Listen. good radio voice, so why not? No, your voice is definitely nice. We'll see what kind of music you know you like, and we put it together. I think we left. We have an oldie show, also. I think it would be great. Maybe you could put yep. it there. And what are you? What out. are you saying there, Noah? I'm not yeah, saying. I, I picked up on that. You said Eric. Okay, you know what? 
<laughs> Gus and Joe, thank you so much for joining us. It was a real, real pleasure. Thank you. Thank, thank you, guys. You. Really appreciate it. It was great to have a chance to spend some time with you. And look, regardless of everything that has happened, I think deep down, every single person here, every single citizen, the five, five plus million people here are really thankful for everything since 1991, what the U.S. has done um, here, the U.S. Is, you know, uh, we've um, had a government great, and the culture. We've had a great partnership with the people in Kurdistan, so um, it's something we definitely want to continue. Give it up, give it up! Thank you so much. Thank you.